Welcome to Faith Evangelical Free Church in Boyceville, Wisconsin for April 19th. My name is Joshua Cruzen and I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Church. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for coming online. I hope that you're in this time getting some good rest, getting some good focusing on God, and, and I just hope that this time is enabling you to turn your hearts to Him. Uh, if you would, please worship with us right now. Uh, we're we're going we're gonna to offer a couple of songs for worship through singing and praise, and just please join us with that. Before I move on to that, though, I'd like to pray and open up the service. Heavenly Father, just thank you so much for this time. Thank you for this technology that's available, that we can still get a message out to people, that we can, we can hold a worship service, that we can provide a message from you, that we can still touch people in their homes, even in this time of social distancing. I just ask that you would be with this whole church, this whole community, and everyone that this message reaches, Lord. We just ask that you would, would, would guide us and, and just give us wisdom and give us strength to get through this time, to, to endure staying at home, and to be be separated from each other, that that is an important thing right now, that we are to listen to the authorities that are appointed over us, and that we would just get this thing to pass. But also, Lord, I just ask that you would, that you would have this time uh, teach us and show us what it is that you're uh, asking us to get out of this time, Lord. I, I, I truly believe that this time is, is helping us and, and causing us to refocus ourselves and to, to rethink how we do daily business and how we do church, how we are the church, and how we are to get on mission for you and to spread the gospel to those that might not know it, Lord. I just ask that you would be with this service, be with this message, be with these people, and then in all things, it, you, you would guide us and help us come closer to you. In your son's name, amen. Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, oh, he's my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, oh, he's my song. You are See our weakness 
but he places his strength in us. We feel so powerless, but his mercy and grace are more than enough. God doesn't see things the way we do. His perfect love defines what is true. So who are we to disagree when God says He loves you and me? He says there's freedom. He says there's freedom. From all of our prisons. From all of our prisons. He asks why we're still inside. Asks why we're still inside. When the door is wide open. The door is wide open. He whispers, I love you. Whispers, I love you. Child, you're not who you used to be. You're not who you used to be. Come let me show you Come let me show you The depths of who you are in me God doesn't see things the way we do His perfect love defines what is true So who are we to disagree? God says He loves you and me, so let His love, love awaken us, us until we see the way God sees. So let so let His love wash over us, wash over us until we see the way God sees. God doesn't see things the way we do. His perfect love defines what is true, so who are we to disagree when God says He loves you and me? Good morning again. I hope you enjoyed worship through song. If you would now, please direct your attention to Matthew chapter 3. Uh, I will be uh, reading from the ESV, the English Standard Version, this morning. Uh, if you've got uh, a Bible at home with you, please turn there. Uh, if you've got an app, if you've got a computer, uh, follow along with the same version that I have if you so choose. Um, but uh, please direct your attention to Matthew chapter 3. Today, I, I hope that many of you are comfortable this morning. That you're probably in your jammies, uh, chilling on the couch with a coffee. Maybe your hair's not done. Maybe you're unshaven. Isn't it nice that we can worship no matter what we look like? I remember when I was a little boy, we wore our absolute best to church. I have a photograph which I absolutely love simply because it's a nice picture of me and my father dressed in our suits for church. I wanted to have a briefcase and wear a suit and be one of the men of the church. But who was I dressing up for? Was I dressing up for myself? Was I dressing up for those around me? Was I dressing up for God? We've come so far as a society. Many think we've lost touch with what it means to be a gentleman or a lady simply because we now dress down. But does God really care? People who come to church, they think they're pretty good. They do their best. They put their best foot forward. They're nice to those around them, or at least they try. They pray. They try not to cuss. You know, the Pharisees thought they were good too. They didn't think they needed to repent. Just as I thought it important to wear nice clothes, I thought I was good enough. Later on in life, I thought I didn't need church. 
I thought I had a relationship with God. I didn't need fellowship. I didn't need an accountability group. I believed in God. I was good to go. Jesus, who didn't need to repent at all for anything, he asked for it. He asked to be baptized. He asked to show repentance. John says, who am I that I'm not even worthy enough to carry your sandals? You should be baptizing me. What lessons can we learn from this act of humility by the king, the perfect one, the lamb? Please turn with me and let's learn a bit more about what it means to repent. In this present time, we sure need it. With this COVID-19 coronavirus hanging over our heads, don't you think the world needs to repent right now? I wonder if God is waiting for our country to drop its act of righteousness in this guise of political games and repent, just as he showed us in Matthew chapter 3. And later in chapter 28, where he commanded us to go, therefore, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you're not there already, please turn with me in Matthew chapter 3. And again, I will be reading from the English Standard Version. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah when he said, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Now John wore a garment of camel's hair and a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locusts and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the, relig and all the region about the Jordan were going out to him, and they were baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance, and do not presume to say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children from Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with an unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to John to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he consented, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water, and behold, the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and coming to rest on him. And behold, a voice from heaven said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. May the Lord bless the reading of the word uh, to your hearts this morning. What does baptism represent? Baptism is defined by Merriam-Webster as an act, experience, or, or, or ordeal by which one is purified, sanctified, initiated, or named. Baptism represents the death of our previous self, the resurrection of a born-again new being in community with Christ. It is through the work that he accomplished on the cross which grants us purification and sanctification where we are named his. Simply, we publicly declare to endeavor the practice of a repentant lifestyle. The biblical characters that we see in Matthew 3, they all practice the repentant lifestyle in their own way. If you would, uh, please just listen for a few so that we can understand how they all did it in their own way. How did John practice a repentant lifestyle? John kind of seems to be the, the main character of this story. So, uh, so, so let's look a little bit about how he stood on the river. He stood on the river. His call was to help people confess their sins to the Lord. A few weeks ago, uh, the, the sermon is available on, on boysvillefree.org under our sermons, where you can go back and listen to it if you haven't already. Uh, it was the sermon on Haggai. I talked a little bit about each of us having a purpose and each of us having a requirement 
to serve with the gifts that God has given us. This was John's gift. This was his purpose in building the church, to stand on the riverbank and to baptize into, rep into repentance. He lived a life separated from a normal society. He was kind of a weird guy, even for first century Judean standards. Uh, now, his conduct was kind of expected, that of a prophet practicing in the strict Jewish sect, the Essenes, but I could just imagine what others thought of him, and even uh, if, if this prophet, John, were to practice the same things that he practiced then, now in this day and age. This was a guy who, says in the, who in the text says that he dressed in camel's hair. He wore a leather belt. I would assume he probably stunk a little bit. He ate some pretty weird stuff. He ate locusts and honey. Wild honey is wonderful. Wild honey tastes great. Uh, my, my wife uh, recently uh, took on a, a, a journey to, to practice beekeeping. Wild honey tastes wonderful. I'm not going to eat locusts anytime soon, though. Another way that he practiced a repentant lifestyle was that he challenged everyone. He called on Jews and Gentiles alike to be baptized, to repent and confess their sins. You see, Jews baptized Gentiles if they converted, but John made it known that the Jews needed to be baptized as well, but they also needed to be baptized in the way that he was describing it. It was quite different from the way that they practiced it. John was making a different case for baptism than Jews practiced. John was telling them that they could be baptized once, and the rite or ritual was complete. Also, it meant something different than what they were practicing as well. It meant that they had a true repentance for their sins and that they wanted their Savior to, 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 to take their sins away. How about the Pharisees? How did they practice a repentant lifestyle? They certainly practiced a, a little bit different than the way John did. They practiced something that we would call a religious discipline. The priests had to be ritually clean in order to serve at the, tab at the tabernacle. And Israelites, who had become ritually unclean, had to restore their situation with the passing of time and bathing their whole body in fresh, ritually clean water. This is according to Levit Leviticus chapter 15. If you've got some time later on, go back and read that and kind of break, uh, uh, brush up on, on some of the requirements that were necessary for ritual cleansing. To remain righteous, they had to wash their entire bodies after some sort of determined expiration date, before certain festivals and holidays throughout the year or before Shabbat, the Sabbath. They had to wash their hands before they ate. They washed a body before it was buried. Women had to practice cleaning themselves before they could touch their husbands after menstrual cycles. They practiced ritual slaughter. They could only walk a certain number of steps on the Sabbath. They could perform no work for 24, 25 hours starting Friday, approximately at sundown, through the completion of nightfall on Saturday. These were all the things that the, the Israelites, the Pharisees, they were all tied to. This was a religious discipline that they all followed, and it's what they believed made them righteous. All these things, um, uh, uh, lastly, they, they, looked at their, they looked at their ancestry. They looked at their bloodline, which somehow raised them above another. Due to their bloodline, they felt that they didn't need repentance. They felt that they were good to go the way that they were, through who they were, in their flesh. Do you see a pattern there? I'll say that again. They thought that they were good to go by who they were in their flesh because of their ancestry. But today, we know that we have a much better way and we have a much better understanding of repentance. They were descendants of Aaron. Even John was in this same bloodline. His parents were Levites, even he, although he was not a priest. All these things that they looked at, that the Pharisees did, as far as a religious discipline, were fine. What the Jews were doing wasn't wrong for their time, but they were missing something. They were missing something that was happening right in front of them, something that was prophesied to happen, but they refused to believe it and they refused to see it. They were following a practice defined in the Pentateuch where they were in a perpetual cycle of bondage. Believers today are not necessarily part of this story, 
but I certainly want to explain on how we practice a repentant lifestyle in our current day and age. There's various ways that, that everyone believes that is the best way to practice a repented lifestyle. Some choose to homeschool. Through homeschooling, parents have more ability to direct the sources of knowledge for their children, or they're able to help them and provide a more focused education away from the potential distractions that come with public life. Many Christians educate in this way, removing their families from a society that pushes a, secular, a secularist belief style. Another way that we practice repentant lifestyle is the way we dress. We're told to dress modestly, regardless of whether we are a man or women. But, however, men are, dress, are, are told to dress in such a way that is honoring to God. And women are told to dress in such a way that is honoring to their husband. Both carrying themselves in such a way that points to the commitment to their spouse. Other ways that we practice a repentant lifestyle is through the way we talk, uh, physical activity, through hobbies. Uh, we, we, we choose not to take the Lord's name in vain. It's a command, so that's really good that we do that. Um, we, 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 are, we try not to belittle or diminish others in conversation. We attempt to talk with love and compassion. We speak with humble language and we do not boast. We honor God with exercise and hobbies and activities which are nurturing to our mind, body, and spirit. Many people take along a regimen, which is, which is an ordered life, which again, I talked about in a, in a recent sermon as well. You can go back and listen to it. It's wonderful to have an ordered life, which is, which is for a purpose. Through entertainment, um, we, we can make choices, and, and people choose to associate themselves with certain movies, TV shows. Many practice family game nights, invite friends over for cards and for coffee, play instruments, sing songs, but we don't do the things and entertain ourselves in, in such a way that the world does, because we know that it is pointing us towards a way which is not really righteous. Many practice daily Bible readings, devotionals, personal study, intense prayer and fasting, in short, the discipline that I've spoke of here and, and, and the, that I've they've talked about before, they're not bad. In fact, this religious discipline is encouraged. However, when these things become an obsession, we cloud the real teaching that Jesus commanded us to carry out. Going back to Matthew 3, I want to uh, talk a little bit about Jesus as the third character of this story. He asked for baptism, but he didn't need to repent at all. He lived a perfect lifestyle. He lived a perfect, sinless life. So why did he do it? Up until now, I've talked about the rite or ritual of baptism as a public declaration to endeavor in the practice of a repentant lifestyle and what it means to live in that life. Jesus states, let it be so now, for thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. He is describing his reason for baptism. Jesus did not need to repent. His act of baptism was him showing his act of love in service and that he identified with us as a human being and as a sinner. You see, Jesus was the greatest leader that this world has ever known. Not only did he tell us what we needed to do, but he showed us exactly how we were to do it. Some of the examples that, that, that he used in his ministry and the way that he called people to himself, we see him bringing in Matthew, right here, um, the, the, the tax collector. Uh, from, from Jewish standpoint, uh, a tax collector was the lowest of the low. There was no reason why the teacher that he claimed to be and that the Jews and the Pharisees called him this teacher, there's no reason why someone of that social status would concern themselves with such sinners and such tax collectors. He ate with them. He ate with his disciples. His disciples were sinners. There was no, there's no argument about that, regardless of what de denomination or what you believe, what theology you believe. His disciples were sinners. They were just like us. He eats with Zacchaeus. The priests rebuke him for associating those which are below him. The Pharisees rebuked him for everything that he did. He conducted himself in such a way that they looked at him and said, how can you call yourself teacher? when you conduct yourself with sinners and you identify with those that are below you. Furthermore, a sinner touches him even, which is something that the Pharisees would, would never have allowed to happen. When the woman wiped his feet with her hair and tears, again, 
something that was absolutely not in common practice during that time. Jesus led by example in all the things that he commanded us to do. His entire ministry, he was drawing people closer to him. He was leading them, but not only was he telling them what they needed to do, not only was he commanding them what they needed to do, again, he showed them exactly how to do it. We are commanded to partake in baptism. Just earlier, in, in, in verse 15, as I read, I said, For thus it is fitting for us to fulfill all righteousness. These are his words. He is saying we should do it. It is important. Verse 17, it is pleasing to the Father. He was in full submission and subjection to his Father's will. We have the Son of God who is telling us to do something, and he said the reason why I did it was because I am fulfilling my Father's will. To me, there's no argument that we have to baptize and that we are commanded to do it for our own selves and then we are commanded to go out and, and find others that would like to come into this repented lifestyle. Give the public declaration that, that they want to be a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. If Jesus was in full submission and in full subjection to the Father's will, are we? We are commanded to baptize others. We don't have to be Baptists. We don't have to be evangelicals. We, we, we can be Lutherans. We can be Catholics. We can be Presbyterians. We can be Methodists. We can be independent Bible churches. We can be whatever we want. But Jesus commands us to baptize. In Matthew 28, verses 18 through 19, he says, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. When I was younger, I looked at religion in a very different way than what I do now. I looked at it as something to be done, something that we did. But I didn't quite understand that to fully accept what it means to be a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ, that we have to carry out his commands. It doesn't matter how I dress. It doesn't matter whether I shave my beard. It doesn't even matter whether or not I bathe. However, most of you would probably enjoy that. It doesn't matter how many steps I walk, and it doesn't matter if I do chores on the Sabbath. God doesn't care. It's not about works. It's not about anything that I do which saves me or makes me righteous. It's about the fact that I do what he has commanded me to do, which is to attempt to be his vessel, his body on earth to point people to him. As individual sinners, we all need to repent. Then we need to help others do the same. We become righteous by giving our life to him, not by practicing religious discipline. We give our life to him by proclaiming we are his. We get baptized. We must show and tell others what he has done for us. We must model the Christian life. We must speak about the good news. In our local church last year, we saw one person baptized. This event was absolutely beautiful. Please don't let me take that, uh, that glory away from that uh, event whatsoever. But let's do everything we can as a local church to baptize one person every month for the rest of the year. Folks, that's nine people. If we start this month. There are ways that this can be accomplished, even in this time of social separation, this social distancing due to this corona, COVID-19 virus. Uh, it, it can be done. If you don't know how, and you're not a part of this church, get a hold of your local pastor and ask them how it can be accomplished. And if you don't belong to this church, that's fine. Work with your local body. Send us a message. Let us know that the heavens are rejoicing and that the angels are singing his praises because one another has come home. If you don't have a church, send a message. Give us a ring, text message, whatever, and ask us how to find a place to belong. We'd love to help you, even if it means not visiting us. Baptize them. Bring them into relationship with the Father. I leave you with this. Our call is to embrace the world as it is and to attempt to make it better through his work on the cross. This is our mission field. Go get on mission and fulfill his righteousness. Go get them, church.